Bam. Cheers, everybody. Welcome back to another video. Today we are going over Scott <clears throat> Adams, who is the creator of the comic strip Gil Dilbert, which was a really popular comic strip back in the 90s, 2000s. Um, we're going to go over his success and also his technique, his process that he uses when it comes to affirmations, robotic affirmations. We're going to cover it. I have my notes here and essentially he's, I took these notes down. He, he had a couple different um, places where he talked about this. He talked about this on Tim Ferriss's podcast. And then he, since then he's made videos where he goes in depth with his process and telling the story, but I'm just going to give you guys a quick rundown right here. So throughout his course of using this process, and I'm going to get into that at the end, <clears throat> he's seen a lot of people that have had great results with it. He also says though, that a lot of people didn't have results with it. And he's going to explain why he thinks that might be the case. But he says that every single time that he's used it, he has gotten his outcome. So it all started when um, he, he was at a friend's um, in his 20s and she, through a series of coincidences, had achieved this thing. I guess she had read about affirmations and she had began writing them down. So she used what he calls the power of contrast on him. Because he says that usually he's pretty skeptical. He doesn't really believe in stuff like this. But that she was like, it doesn't cost anything. And this could literally rewrite your entire reality. So he was like, okay, okay, I'm going to give this a try. Because he was always curious. He always looked into things, even, even when he was skeptical. And she said to pick something that wouldn't happen and that was very unlikely. So he says in his interview that the G-rated version of this was that he wanted to date a girl that worked in the same building as him that he didn't even know. So <clears throat> through a series of very strange coincidences, he doesn't go into the coincidences, which would have been cool if he did. He says that shouldn't have happened where they would end up on the same elevator. And then he goes to lunch and sees her, runs into her. And then they end up going on a date. And then the rest was history, right? And But the thing is, at the end of this, when he had accomplished this initial intention he had, he said, instead of saying, well, I guess those affirmations work really well, he went, well, I guess I have more game than I thought, right? So that was his way of rationalizing that, you know, this is just must really be because I just have like way more game than I thought I had. Because in his, in his mind, this girl was way out of his league, is what he said. He said that there was no way that somebody like him should have been dating a girl like her. So in any case, he, he came to the conclusion that this was an inconclusive experiment. So shortly after this, he got in a bet about taking the GMAT, which was a test that he had not scored well in. And, it, and it's also a test where they say that you can't really raise your score to be much higher than what you initially get on it. So he made a bet that he would outscore his friend when she got her score was in the high 80s and he was only in the high 70s. And so she was like, okay, bring it on. So he used his affirmations. Imagine the test where he's with the score he wanted, where he went from a 77 all the way up to a 94 on the test. He thought this was definitely impossible. And if something does happen, then maybe there is something to this process of affirmations. So he was taking these practice tests and every single time he would score again in the high 70s, no matter what conditions, whether he drank coffee, whether he was underslept, doesn't, didn't matter. He always scored the same kind of score, like a very similar score, right? High 70s. So the day comes and he takes the test. He goes back to his apartment, opens the result. And in the, in the interim, in the time being, he had been imagining, because he had, he had seen this, um, this opening letter before with the test results, because he had previously gotten the high 70s and 77. So he was also practice visual, practicing visualization during this, where he was imagining receiving that letter with a 94 on it. So he goes to his apartment, opens the results, sits down at the, at the coffee table on the couch. He said in his dingy San Francisco apartment, opens the letter and sees the result that the number said 94. 
So he almost didn't believe that this was real. And this evening, he spent the evening sitting there on his couch and taking the letter, picking it up, looking at the letter, reading it, putting it back down. And he did this, he said, for hours that night, all to make sure that it was actually real. And he ended up going to Berkeley and getting his MBA, all based on this bet. So he set himself the goal of then getting rich in the stock market. So he woke up one day thinking that he should buy the Chrysler stock. And by the time he'd gotten his stock account open, this was back in the day with like snail mail and stuff, it, the stock had already gone up quite a bit. Um, but he still bought it. He still won. He still made some money with it, but he sold it too soon. And it was the number one stock that year. Then he bought the Ask stock. I'm not sure if that was Ask Jeeves or some other company at the time, but he sold it after a 10% in increase. Again, he sold it too soon um, because it went up way higher than that. So then this is when he came up with the his actual technique, which now we're going to get into, <clears throat> where he said, I, Scott Adams, will be a famous cartoonist. Or he might have said, I will be a syndicated cartoonist. Um, and then he created another one from there, which was, will become a number one New York Times bestselling author. And both of those things he accomplished, See, he became, he, he was the creator of that, like I said, Dilbert, which was one of the best, most famous cartoons during this time period that we're talking about. Um, he ended up becoming a number one <clears throat> New York Times bestselling author. And then he also lost his ability to speak due to something called spasmatic dysphonia which was a rare kind of debilitating issue. And he actually found, so he did this for that as well, where he said he's going to be able to speak perfectly. And eventually he found somebody with an experimental, exper experimental surgery who actually fixed this issue. And now he can, he can speak just fine. So this is his process. He says to write or repeat an objective 15 times a day. And his, the one example that he gives is, I, Scott Adams, will be a syndicated cartoonist. And he would write this 15 times a day. He says write or repeat, but I, I think in the example that he gave, he mentions that he was writing this out 15 times a day. So he probably wrote it and repeated. Um, <clears throat> but he says that, it could, that this could be whatever your goal is. It could be, will be... Uh, receiving an Oscar, or will be living in my dream home in X city, will be wealthy, find love, start a family, whatever it is that you want. But he says, you don't want to be too specific. Because what if there's something better? And he said to go fairly general. And this is what I always talk about when I talk about going vague, instead of going for that specific person, or instead of going for that thing that is like this exact house and this exact address, you know, why not leave open the possibility that you are going to get your dream home in that city and then being open to those possibilities because then that opens the way for the universe, whatever whatever it is, to bring in all these different opportunities because it could be that or something better, much like he says. And also gets rid of that attachment, that needy attachment type of energy that's there when you really, really need something to be a particular way, done a certain way. It just makes it harder for that thing to happen a lot of the time. He says the exception to this is that there's nothing better than a syndicated cartoonist. So if you wanted to be like, like in that example of like winning an Oscar or you wanted to be a best-selling um, author, then <clears throat> those things are specific because they are really nothing's better than that in, in his words. I would say that even now, like you don't necessarily even need to, to think that way even now because let's say that you wanted to be a best-selling author you could just put out an intention that I'm going to sell over a million copies of my book, right? <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily have to have, you can, you can do whatever, you can do it however you want. I'm just saying that there's other options, there's other avenues. Now, instead of getting an Oscar or getting a Grammy, you could be, you know, have over a million streams uh, a month or two million streams a month, right? There's all kinds of different metrics that exist nowadays for you to still kind of achieve a goal that's in the, that realm that you want to achieve it in. Um, it could be like, yeah, um, I am a successful creative. I'm a, I'm a highly paid influencer that gets to travel around the world 
and that gets my tri my trips paid for. Um, <clears throat> I'm always getting invited to the best and trendiest events all across the world. Um, I work with the biggest brands. I work with the, the biggest and most influential brands in the world. I work with the top fashion house brands. I work with high fashion luxury brands and luxury brands pay me for my content and for my presence for me participating in content create their content creation or for them for me for me creating content for the brands i get paid for that okay so he says that visualizing is part of the pro process the hypothesis is that if you stick with this and he believes that there's he doesn't have an exact answer to why he thinks that this works right because remember again he's very skeptical and he, he likes to, in his explanations of this, he's, he kind of breaks it down. He says, one thing that it could be is that if you stick with this, there's some part of you that believes you can pull it off because there were certain things that he had such a burning desire, he maintained the process because he's had a lot of other goals, he said, which he didn't maintain this process of writing it down 15 times a day. So the, even the fact that you're willing it, to write it down almost convinces yourself that it's possible or else you wouldn't program your filter, he uses the same language that I've used many times, to make more opportunities to present themselves. Um, there's also the theory, there's also the RAS, which we talk about a lot on the channel, you know, tuning into those opportunities that your brain is now primed to seek out those opportunities because you've been feeding it with this input. So you've primed your lens or your filter of reality so that it's showing you more of that, or at least that you're t tuning into more of that. Um, you're finding out what you're willing to work hard for. And they've done a study on luck. And I've talked about this study as well, that people that consider themselves to be lucky end up finding things, end up running into more opportunities. Um, they did one where they ended up finding money on the ground. The other people didn't find the money. They've done one where um, they were reading pages in a book and the lucky ones knew how many pages there were because it said on like the third page that there's this many pages and you can stop reading now. Whereas the people that didn't consider themselves lucky, they didn't see that, right? So the RAS is really, it's, a, it's really very legit. We're always tuning in to information that we perceive as relevant. And if we consider ourselves to not be lucky, we're not gonna be open to those opportunities, right? For luck to find us. But he says, regardless, it's completely unknowable, but it doesn't cost you anything to try it. So he's using the same kind of pitch that he got pitched on by his friend when he was in his 20s. It doesn't cost you anything to try, and if it works, it could change the world. So he also makes a point here at the end that we're all in our own bubbles of reality, which we've talked about so many times on this channel, and he acknowledges that as well because he talks about using the examples of religion, you know, people that are in their own political viewpoints, political party, whatever. Um, some people believe in magical things, mystical things. Some people believe something's bad. So other people believe that's good. And those those different lenses and filters just show us right there that we all have our own filters. We're all really living in our own bubble. And that's what Nassim Hermain talks about. We are all walking white holes and black holes. And you can really think about it like we are energetically too. There is a toroidal field of energy around us that we are emanating. Uh, that is that is our energetic bubble and it's our electromagnetic field as well it's just it's all energy right everything <clears throat> everything when you boil it all down to what is this what is this atoms whatever it, it's all gets to energy is the is the answer right and we don't even know <laughs> we there's so much that we don't know but we do know that we are we do know that much that everything is operating through energy frequency vibration and when you really uh when you really come to that understanding that we are like these little bubbles, and that's why I talk about, you know, we're all existing in our own worlds. In our own worlds, we can create, but also somebody else exists in their own world. So <clears throat> the more and more belief, the more and more action, the more and more that you embody that which it is that you were wanting to bring into life, now your bubble has more power. You could, you could think of it like that, where it has more weight to it. It has more of a gravitational field because the more dense or the more... Um, you know, like a black hole, <clears throat> it sucks things into it, right? So if you have that more and more of that intentional energy going on, now you're beginning to bend reality to your will. That's another way that you could think about it. But um, 
with that being said, guys, let me know what your guys' thoughts are on this. I think it would definitely be a worthwhile exercise to try to write down your main intention, your goal, 15 times a day. And he has it phrased like that, doing it in that phrasing. I, your name, will be a syndicated cartoonist or famous musician or famous YouTuber or best-selling author, like whatever whatever the goal is. Um, <clears throat> entrepreneur that makes over $100,000 a month, whatever whatever the goal is. I think it could be a great way <laughs> to begin to prime that, prime that pump. And basically, you know, it, it's just another technique. And he's had great success with it. He said a lot of people have also had great success with it. And you can even see, if you look up Scott Adams' um, affirmation success stories on YouTube, you can see people are making videos where they've actually had success using this exact technique. So that being said, guys, much love as always. Drop this with a like. Let me know your thoughts down below. And I will see you guys in the next video.